These guys are always in suits whenever they're in the posters or the trailers, so I'm going to wear a suit-ish kind of outfit for this review. I think it looks cool, plus I'm, I'm having a job interview next week, so I kind of try some stuff out. What do you guys think? How do I look? Hey everyone, TV here. So I'm a little bit tired. It's late Thursday night. I just got back from a little bit of Black Friday browsing. I found a couple of video games that were a little bit cheaper than usual, so I nabbed that and I went to go see this movie. So it's kind of late in the night and I'm a little bit tired, so I'm going to try to keep it as short as possible. But apparently I'm not tired enough to dig this up. But here I am to bring you guys another movie review and this time it is for the sequel to Horrible Bosses. Horrible Bosses 2. Yes, that first movie that was actually a bit of a surprise hit, telling the story of these three guys who are so miserable with not only their jobs, but the people that would oppress them on a daily basis, that they were driven to the point of murder. And so now we get to see those three guys again, only this time they need to pull off a kidnapping in order to extort money from this guy who practically screwed them over over this idea that they had to become entrepreneurs of their own. And trust me, when I saw the very first trailer for this movie, in fact, when I first heard that they were going to make a sequel to Horrible Bosses, the first thing that came to my mind is, of course, The Hangover Part 2, where they're going to try to milk this thing as much as possible because the first one was such a surprised hit and it had great chemistry amongst the, the three leads. It was really funny. It was an original concept. And so now we're going to do it all over again because, hey, we made money. Fortunately, I'm happy to say that this actually exceeded my expectations. Now, was it better than the first one? No. Was it unnecessary? Yes. But was it delightfully kind of fun? I'd say quite a bit, actually. First of all, the, the thing right off the bat, based on that synopsis th that is actually quite good for the sequel, is the fact that it wasn't actually that much of a rehash as I thought it was going to be. I thought that we were going to legitimately find new bosses, new jobs, and now they need to deal with these guys because the bosses are terrible once more. And I'm like, really? And to be honest, the trailers didn't convince me otherwise. It still gave me the impression that they were going to go work for these other guys. And they took away their money somehow. And so now instead of planning to murder somebody, they're going to kidnap, kidnap them. But then after watching the movie, it turns out that they actually made these characters achieve, uh, want to achieve a much more personal goal by uh, wanting to be their own bosses and therefore didn't feel that much of a rehash. And I commend for the writers making these characters actually want to do something for themselves once rather than to do the idiotic thing of going to work for somebody else after their experiences in the first movie. And you as a moviegoer should really savor the idea that they didn't do something that idiotic for once because they still do some idiotic things in this movie. and. I'll get to that in a little while, but I really commend the writers for actually making the premise of this movie quite different than the one in the first and, and not doing the same thing uh, shot for shot like The Hangover Part 2 did. And these guys are still really funny and because of the fact that they're doing something of their own, inventing this thing that was <laughs> in and of itself kind of stupid. Personally, I while watching the movie, I never got the gist of what this invention they made involving a, a shower or whatever shit, the shower buddy. I didn't get what it was. I mean, it, it, it dispenses shampoo and it washes you at the same time. I don't know, why can't you do that by yourself? But anyways, it, it was cool that they it made their own invention and it made it more personal. So when they these guys get screwed over, I understand why they are driven to the point of wanting to kidnap this guy for ransom. And like the first movie, they put things there to sensibly make this the last option for them. They put things to where they're like, oh yeah, this is our only option. This is the only thing that we, we can really do, just like in the first movie. But just like in the first movie, as sensical as it is, it's also the most illogical resort. It's the thing that no sensible human being, no human being in the right mind would actually try to do this. But of course, these guys are nowhere near the right mind. Just like in the first movie, they're a trio of idiots. But Unlike in the first movie, and this is probably my biggest complaint with the movie, as it goes on, they get almost stupider and stupider. I mean, in the first movie, yeah, they were dumb, but this was their first time. <laughs> there was the first time tackling this sort of big uh, uh, plot to murder three people. And sure, they take it down a notch by somebody just kidnapping in this one, but they it, it, they act almost as if they didn't do what they did in the first one. And they have a couple of lines where they're like, hey, we did that before, let's not try to do this again. But then towards the latter half of the movie, they were starting to turn into the Three Stooges, but the, the bad version of the Three Stooges, the Ferrelli brothers of the Three Stooges, where 
they they should know certain things. And Jason Bateman is just there going, uh, being the mo of the group. He's like, don't you notice these things? I mean, the the version the versions of th these guys in the first movie will look at these guys in the second movie and be like. You stupid idiot. So I understand that you have to make your characters a little dumb so that they can go that extra mile to take this illogical uh, exit out of their situation, but not to this point. Fortunately, what saves them is the chemistry because the chemistry is still there. Between these three guys, Jason Bateman, Jason, Jason Sudeikis, and Charlie Day, they are still great. They still have perfect comedic timing and they have several jokes that made me laugh. Uh, most of them are chuckle-worthy, but there's actually a few of them that for the very first time in a really long time I was actually eating popcorn while watching this movie and there were moments where I had to control myself or else I was gonna choke on my own food. Jamie Foxx is back again as motherfucker Jones. Yeah, I'm gonna say his name because it's really, I don't know. I just think it's kind of funny. It's stupid, but it's funny. He he was actually pretty good too and he had a wider role instead of just sitting in the same booth and I was actually pleasantly surprised by that. And somebody that was also immensely surprising was Chris Pine as one of the guys, the, the son of the father-son group that screws these guys over. I knew from the bat and from the trailers that he was going to be that douchebag son who gets everything, you know, he's rich, he cries to daddy whenever he's in trouble, and I knew that he was going to play that very well because Chris Pine just has that look to him that he could pull that off very well, and plus Captain Kirk ha it can be kind of douchey sometimes, so he excelled at that, and I'm pretty sure he was going to excel here, but what was most surprising is that he was able to pull off a certain turn that his character takes that I didn't really see coming, I was like, Whoa, this is, wow, was not expecting it at all, and Chris Pine pulled it off very well. And one of the funniest gags uh, from, from this movie was that his character reminded me of another character of another movie that then a character in this movie references right when I was thinking it, right when it came into my mind. One of the characters in, in that particular scene brought it up and made the reference, and I'm like... Exactly! And then you got the rest of the cast that is tremendous. I mean, you got Jennifer Aniston back, you got Kevin Spacey back, you got Christoph Waltz. Is it Waltz? Waltz? I don't know. But you got Christoph Waltz and Jonathan Banks playing the role of a cop here. Oh, what happened? I'm a little mixed amongst the rest of this cast because there were a couple of players here that didn't feel like they were into the material that they were cast for, which are Jonathan Banks and Christoph Waltz. B both of the characters that they played could have been played by anybody, especially Christoph, who was playing the main boss, Henson, the horrible boss in question that screwed these guys over. And he's obviously played uh, uh, one of the most iconic villains in the in this whole past decade, the Jew Hunter from Inglourious Bastards. It's what won him his first Oscar in, in recognition amongst the, the United States. But here, it just looked like he was killing time to get that phone call from Quentin Tarantino like, hey, you want to be in Hateful Eight? Same thing with Jonathan Banks. Anybody could have really played his character, but it was cool to see him here. And let's go ahead and talk about these couple of characters that returned from the first movie, Jennifer Aniston and, and Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey has nothing but a mere cameo in this movie, which is what I was expecting from the trailer, being that he was in that one scene where he's talking to them across the glass in the prison. And I'm like, something tells me that's going to be the only scene of his in this movie, and sure enough, it was. And it's a shame because this is Kevin Spacey. I love Kevin Spacey. I love anything that he, he's in, whether it be dramatic or comedic at this point. And he was still great here being that cynical, conniving boss. Even when he's in prison, he just does not let up. And he had a couple of lines that were genuinely funny. But then we got to Jennifer Aniston, and it is at that point where I'm like, oh man, all they're going to do is bring back these two people for cameos. Just to say, hey, look, they're, they're here, and now they're gone. But then... I noticed that Jennifer Aniston had a larger role. And then when I noticed that she had a larger role, I'm like, never mind, I'm good with cameos, I'm good. Because then her character ends up having a larger role in the movie and, instead of just a cameo. And I'm like, oh, they should have switched it. It should have had Jennifer Aniston be a cameo. And Kevin Spacey had a larger role in this movie because I preferred his character over Jennifer Aniston's. Because out of the three bosses that they were trying to get rid of in the first movie, Jennifer Aniston's was the one that... I really wanted to see her get taken out because I'm not gonna say, I can't say she, I hate her, but I don't really care about her. She doesn't really do anything for the plot for me, and I I don't find anything appealing about her as a character physically. Hey, I mean she has her moments where I'm like Brad, 
Brad, what were you thinking? <laughs> Though to be fair, there's a couple of interesting things they do with her character that I found kind of nice. One of them involves her own personal affliction that I'm like, okay, you know, in, in, in the sensical world that would make sense. I like that they did it with, with her. And the second one involves Jason Bateman's character. I'm not going to ruin it, but I thought it was actually quirky and weird and kind of fun. Now I'm talking about the story and the characters and their actors, but I'm not really tackling about the, the whether or not this movie's funny because it is, after all, a comedy. Well, I already said that the three main leads have perfect comedic time and they still had plenty of moments that made me laugh out loud. But this movie also suffers a couple of, uh, of issues. One of them is the one that plagues an awful lot of comedies these days, and that is not knowing when to cut. Having the director let their actors ad-lib so much that the editor then feels bad about cutting their material that they just they take a joke and they continue running with it and at first it's kind of funny but then it starts to dilute a little bit or dilute 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 whatever but you get what i'm saying and that happens a couple of moments here i didn't think it happened as frequent and as apparent as 22 jump street but it still had its moments where i felt like they could have just ended a little bit earlier and ended that joke on a high note and the other issue would be that this is not directed by Seth Gordon who did the first one he's currently in the development of the Uncharted movie so they got a new director and because they got a new director to me personally it never it, never, it didn't feel as snappy and as quick as the first movie did whereas the first one felt like there was just a, a, a new joke moving and, and after that just another joke and then another joke and they didn't really stretch out jokes like they did here it, it, the pacing was faster and it was much more funny and because there were certain moments where you were still laughing and there was another joke it had its fair share of replay value I guess you could say but here there were it, it just felt a little bit more loose it still had its moments where it was snappy and, and witty but it just wasn't as much as the first but by majority rule I still consider this movie to be funny and I remember telling my friend that even though I, I was immensely skeptical about this movie as much as she was I told her that hey just like 22 Jump Street even if it is a rehash of the first if it has enough funny material in it because it's a comedy after all then I'll, I'll go with it I'll uh, approve of it and as unnecessary as, as, as it is as a sequel I still think that it was funny enough it and most importantly it, they tried they actually tried with the material. It, it's, it's almost like the writers, the filmmakers, and the actors wanted to recreate the magic of the first, and I felt like they succeeded for the most part, but they still didn't achieve the full magic that the original did. And so for that, I'll, I'll say that I still had f fun with the movie, but I wouldn't necessarily see it again. I'm not going to YouTube clips of it saying, oh my god, that was my favorite scene ever. I would still go back to the first. So for that, I give Horrible Bosses to a high 7 out of 10. So thank you guys for watching. Let me know what you guys thought of the movie. Let me know if you guys worked over Black Friday weekend and if you had a horrible boss of your own. And I'm going to go take care of this job interview. So wish me luck. I'll see you guys next time.